All right, everyone can take a seat. So, but keep in mind, everyone, keep in mind those numbers. Keep in mind those numbers because that is going to be critical when I introduce my church. So, <laughs> at least we got creative. So, good morning. I am Jared Mullen, and my change project deals with the opioid epidemic. The opioid epidemic is something that has really ravaged the United States over the past four or five years. So, to get us started, I'm. Here's, my, here's the roadmap. We're going to be discussing three major research, research points that I've developed in this, introducing my new plan, how to implement the plan, and then to give you guys some parting reflections and references, and then we can all go home. So, to start off, the opioid epidemic is out of control. Overdose rates have only been on the increase since 2016, and once that I found rather shocking. For every one fatal overdose, there are nine non-fatal, meaning one, every time one person, one in every 10 people that overdose will die from it. And the data behind it is rather astonishing. In 2017, over 70,000 people died from drug overdoses. If that's one every 10, that number indicates that in just 2017 alone, over 500,000 people od from various opioids. And like I said, it's only been on the increase. In 2016, 60,000 people died from drug overdoses, and in 2015, there was around the 50,000 mark. So it's out of control. It needs to be done. My second point, and this was even more shocking, the main age groups that are affected by the opioid crisis is young adults and adolescents. Adolescents being 12 to 17, and young adults being ages 18 to 25. In 2018, eight million young adults, I mean people aged from 18 to 25, used opioids once. So another question, I kinda want you guys to close your eyes for this. Um, how, many, um, how many of you know someone that used opioids? So, it's rather astonishing. Um, it's our age group we have what we have all sorts of I don't want to say problems because that's more of a strong word but we all have we all go through life we're all go, we all have our stresses we all have our academics we all have our extracurricular activities being a young adult and adolescent is stressful wouldn't you guys agree so of that 8 million 2.5 million um, constantly misused opioids at least two times in a given month. So 2.5 million abuse opioids twice a month, whether it's dealing with stress or enhance, like um, there are some opioids that can be also qualified as performance enha enhancing drugs that like really sharp, that can really affect your mental awareness of what's going on. So, and it's being used for all sorts of reasons, whether it's stress, problems at home, get away, everything's on the table. So, and then of that 2.5 million, 2.4 million have developed a drug, like they've seen a doctor and have been diagnosed with drug addiction. Injured adolescents and young adults in, injured in sports are one of the biggest groups to be affected by this. Um, athletes, when going through a serious injury, I mean, did you, you went through a serious injury this semester, what was it again? My foot. Your foot? It's, doctors, this is gonna lead me into my second point, doctors are gonna prescribe opioids on a more, on a very constant basis because face it, treating, dealing with the pain is a very real, is a very real um, point of attack for, sorry, is a real point of attack for recovery. So um, there was a survey conducted um, by um, the C conducted by the CDC and it interviewed NFL players. And I found this rather interesting. In an NFL survey that sh showed that 68, per 68 of NFL players are injured on a given year. Um, of that 68 play of that 68 percent, 52 percent of those players were diagnosed with opioids. And that of that 58%, 71% had 
misuse those opioids. Um, and the point I'm trying to get at is, of that 71%, 44% had drug habits going all the way back dealing with injuries and, P and using PEDs going all the way back to high school. So whether it's using opioids or not, NFL players were developing drug habits in high school and college. Um, the sources, just to put that out there, the resources I've used for this slide come from rehabs.com, which is an accredited source from the American Addiction Center, and also SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services. And then my last point came from statistical information from the Health of, Department of Health and Human Services and the Center for Disease Control. So the third point, sorry, so the third and final point that really connects everything together with what my research has found is that pharma school companies show no restraint in producing opioids. Of all the drug opioid deaths between 2016 and now, approximately 43% of those death, deaths resulted in using a prescription opioid or the patient had a history of using prescription opioids for various medical conditions. In two studies conducted um, by the Harvard School of Public Health, there are two um, main factors that really apply into that. Um, opioid manufacturers pay US doctors huge sums of money for speaking, consulting, and other services to indicate support and show favoritism towards various opioids. Um, it's a rather cost-effective, bringing it, treating opioid, developing opioids like Oxycontin, Vicodin, just for example, can bring in a lot of profit for pharmaceutical companies. And there was also a program ad that dates all the way back to the 1990s that sh indicated pharmaceutical, that pharmaceutical companies present that these, that the addiction um, chances of these opioids were um, very minimal and those were shown to be extremely wrong. So, and then just to reaffirm the point, patients recovering from serious injuries have greater chances of becoming a drug addict. In another survey, patients who saw frequent or so-called high-intensity prescribers were three times as likely to, um, high-intensity opioid prescribers were a result of major injuries and they were, and these injured people, were more likely to have, receive a prescription for opioids as patients seen by infrequent uh, prescribers. Individuals treated by most frequent prescribers were 30% more likely to become long-term opioid users. So it's, we live in a very physical society. We're always constantly on the move. We're always doing something. And that increases chances of becoming injured and, uh, and increased stress levels. So when people turn to medical, doctors to diagnose these medical conditions, doctors will prescribe opioids. So, with that, all that being said, I have a new plan. And this is a plan I really, really like. And that is a new state-of-the-art federal drug rehab center. So, before I get into it, I know I'm filled with questions, I love public participation. If you have health insurance, how much do you guys think um, going to a private rehab center would cost you? Anyone just want to throw out a number? 40,000. 40? Yeah. <laughs> and that's actually right on, well, almost right on the money. An average health insured, an average um, health insured family will spend upwards of 43 to $46,000 on a given year for drug treatment. And that number drastically rises to over $150,000 for non-insured families. So, there are, there are a lot of possibilities and a lot of benefits that a new federal drug rehab center would create. When it comes to treatment, it's another source for drug treatment. Um, we're, um, a couple years ago, I um, interviewed a family friend who also happens to be a drug judge, Judge Michael Astrab out of Cuyahoga County. And um, at the time, in 2017, um, approximately 45% of drug users that um, were facing charges in the Cuyahoga County Justice System um, were like choosing like to be arrested and found guilt and kind of like yeah found guilty of these crimes because the Cuyahoga County Jail was at the time the largest source 
to receive drug treatment. Like, think about it. In order to receive sufficient medical treatment, people are turning to the cops to get themselves arrested. That way they have a chance um, for a detox bed because they can't afford um, private rehab centers. So it's gonna be another sort, it's another way to bring in, it's another option for those families afflicted um, with drug addiction. Monetary benefits, um, I believe this would be all encompassing, all forms of insurance, whether it's private, state, federal, uh, health insurance. Um, it's going to introduce another option for families to receive drug treatment, whether they're from high income families or low income families. Like the amount states, the amount people spend, in my opinion, is ridiculous. Like that's, this is a very real issue. And in order to combat the issue, we need, there needs to be another, there needs to be another way to combat this. And then for education benefits, rehab centers will have the ability to go out and conduct community impact operations. While all of us have a general awareness of this, what's going on, how can we localize it? Like, how can we put a community spin to it? Because I know everyone in this class, at least, comes from various different areas. And it's going to, and the opioid crisis affects different areas through different methods. Like, coming from Cleveland, Cleveland is not just one of the largest um, afflicted state, afflicted areas in the state, but also in the country. Um, Introducing these kinds of options broadens um, introducing this kind of option and with a localized um, point of attack, it's going to reduce um, drug rates significantly. So how would it be possible? So I asked you to put numbers on the board. And honestly, who had hold on. Wow. None of these are really close. But whoever had 47.5 billion is probably the closest. Thanks. The US, over the past four years, the US government has spent almost $1 trillion. Yeah, $1 trillion. The exact number hovers in the 750 millions. And that is just over the past four years. So, money, it's rather important, and we know the money has had it. And the most, and um, there are two departments, well, one department, one agency that have really localized and spent the majority of that money and that is the US Department of Health and Human Services and the Center for Disease Control so setting this up would probably would fall to the CDC they're the ones in the field conducting research figuring out what's going on and they also have very special they can also implement very specialized teams to combat these so it'd be CDC teams um, going out to various regional areas where these drug centers would be set up um, and then recruiting from local areas to um, treat the drug crisis. So, and then partnerships, another critical aspect is partnerships with state and local governments. Partnerships develop new ideas. Where, where can building this rehab center uh, take place? Another example from my home county of Cuyahoga County. Um, the, there are two jails, jail one, jail two, um, for the Cuyahoga County justice system. And there are currently talks right now of, um, since jail two is only about 10%, um, only 10% of the jail population resides in jail two, is turning it into a drug treatment center for those inmates housed in jail one. Um, because drug conviction, because drug court and drug um, arraignments is dramatically on the increase. There was one time I sat in um, on an arraignment hearing, and that day over 150 people were, were arraigned um, for various charges from drugs to murder and all that. But the majority, if memory serves you right, it was about 55% of those being arraigned were facing some sort of drug charge, whether it was drug trafficking, drug possession, drug usage. Um, so it's very prevalent in our justice system. Um, what, and these partnerships can determine what regions need more attention than others? My local community, Strongsville's the opioid epidemic really hasn't hit it, hit my area, but when it comes to the inner suburbs of Cleveland and suburbs closer around Cleveland, it's gonna vary. So local governments can give a more local point of view to place a point of attack where 
the most affected regions of the opioid endemic has reached. And then the last point, it's going to bring more awareness. More awareness is critical to the success of this. We are, like I said, we are all aware of what's going on, but do we really know the in-depth details of what is going in in our community? And by awareness and by spreading education and telling people what's going on in a community, that community is more than likely going to come together because it's a community problem. It's a community, state, and national problem. And these are aspects where that can be implemented on different um, areas. So, to wrap up, um, just want to give some parting reflections. For my um, community interview, I interviewed family friend and Cuyahoga County Deputy Sheriff Mike Long. And this really stuck with me when we were wrapping up. In 15 years as a deputy, I have seen the best and the worst fall into the trap of opioids. Like, this is an all-encompassing problem, and I really want to emphasize that because what we hear on the news and what is going on can be two totally different things. Like, um, this was a few years ago when I was in high school. Um, I was told a story of a football player from St. Ignatius, a really well uh, respected private Catholic school in Cleveland. And um, he tore his ACL, um, ending his football career in the season. And he turned and he was prescribed opioids. Um, it was later found by the person told, that told me that story that five years after it happened, because I think it happened in like 2010, 2011, um, he was arraigned in drug court for heroin, traffic, for heroin trafficking. So this stuff progresses over time. And by fighting it now, we're literally saving our, generations from, our generation from future problems that this problem will arise in five, 10 years from now. So, I don't know. We all have our different perspectives, but all in all, something needs to be done. With that, questions, comments, concerns? These are my references.